Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap, and if you're thinking about buying a new monitor, then choosing the right one can be pretty overwhelming. There's so many different things to consider. Size, resolution, panel type, refresh rates, G-Sync, FreeSync, ports, HDR. It's a lot, but don't worry, I'm gonna talk you through everything you need to know. So monitors can be anything from 20 up to 49 inches in size, but the two most common sizes for new displays are 24 inches and 27 inches. And they provide a good amount of screen space for productivity and gaming as either a main or even a secondary monitor for your laptop. And they also suit a variety of budgets. You can find decent 24 inch monitors for around hundred pounds. 27 inch monitors offer an increase in screen space and are more popular with gamers and power users. And they start from a little over 200 pounds. So that's size, but then we have resolution, which refers to the number of horizontal pixels and vertical pixels on a screen. The higher the number, the sharper the image. Most 24 inch monitors will have a resolution of 1920 horizontal pixels by 1080 vertical pixels. That's also known as full HD. Some 27 inch monitors will have the same resolution, but because the screen is bigger, the number of pixels is spread out over a larger area, which means the image can appear softer and fuzzier. The solution to this is choose a higher resolution, such as 2560 by 1440 or Quad HD, which is common on more expensive 27 inch models and gives a sharper overall image. Next up are 4K screens. These have a 3840 by 2160 resolution, so the image is very sharp and detailed, and they're particularly good for graphic designers or creative professionals. They are of course more expensive than full or Quad HD monitors, and are kind of overkill for most users. I mean, gaming in 4K requires a seriously beefy PC, and unless you have a high-end graphics card like a NVIDIA RTX 2080 or better, then you probably won't be able to use high settings in games and still get a consistent 60 FPS or above. You'll also need to have the right display ports on your computer, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So for most gamers, I'd recommend a good Full HD or Quad HD panel, unless you're after the sharpest possible image or have a 4K capable console you're looking to use with the screen. And even then, I'd suggest getting a larger 32 inch model to get the most benefit out of 4K, as it can be difficult to see all that fine detail on smaller 27 inch screens. Now, if you are looking to edit 4K content, I mean, I shoot these videos in 4K, then you may actually want to consider a 5K monitor, which boosts the pixel count by about a third, and it allows you to display the full 4K content on the screen and still have a few pixels left over for the editing software toolbars around the edge. And if that's not enough, then we also have 8K TVs and monitors, which are on the way, but the cost and the lack of availability means I'm going to leave them to one side for now. And finally, in terms of screen sizes, we have ultra wide or even super ultra wide. Now, most monitors and TVs have a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, whereas ultra wides like this have a 21 by 9 aspect, which makes them around 30% wider. Super ultra wides take this a step further with a 32 by 9 aspect ratio. Now, both types are great if you need extra screen space for multiple programs or loads of browser tabs open at the same time, or if you want a wider, more immersive gaming experience. These screens tend to be curved to wrap around you a little bit and make sure that the corners of the screen aren't too far away from your eyes. Now, personally, I use an ultra wide every single day for working and gaming, and they are my favorite type of monitor to use. But then super ultra wides have the advantage of being the equivalent of two full HD or two quad HD panels side by side with exactly double the number of horizontal pixels, which is very useful if you want to display two programs or images or videos in their native resolution on each half of the screen. And they're also the natural replacement for existing two screen setups, but without that horrible bezel in the middle, and of course with fewer cables. You can also get some great gaming focused ultra wides, but these tend to be quite expensive. And again, with a high resolution, you'll need a pretty powerful PC to get decent frame rates in modern games. For most people then, and gamers who want an ultra wide, I would go with either a 29 inch 2560 by 1080 or a 34 inch 3440 by 1440 model. And if you are a professional who would benefit from that extra screen space, then a 43 or 49 inch super ultra wide would be your best option. Just a quick thought on the actual design of the monitor. Now, most will be pretty boring to look at, but more expensive models can look pretty nice with brushed effect materials and metal stands like this one. 
it is worth considering how it'll actually look on your desk. I mean, gaming monitors range from subtle to definitely not so subtle. And if you want a curved ultra wide, then bear in mind it won't sit flush against a wall. More important though is the stand. Some monitors offer height and tilt and rotational adjustments, whereas others offer only limited movement. So if you do think you'll be making some adjustments, then make sure you check the specs of the monitor. And also if you're planning to wall mount it, then make sure that it is visa mount compatible. Okay, so the next most important thing to consider is the screen panel type. This is pretty important as it will determine how good the image looks. There are four main types, TN, IPS, VA, and OLED, although this is still very rare, with the first two being the most common. Now, TN panels tend to be the most affordable, but at the expense of image quality. TNs offer fast response times, high refresh rates, up to 240 hertz, although IPS monitors are catching up, and minimal input lag. Don't worry, I'll explain those terms in a minute. But that means that they're great for fast-paced gaming. Now, on the downside, they do have the poorest contrast, the lowest color accuracy, and the viewing angles aren't very good. So if you're not sat directly in front of your screen, the color shift and the contrast suffers. Then we have IPS screens, which are the next most popular after TN, and they provide the best overall quality with improved brightness, contrast, more accurate colors, and far better viewing angles than TN. Some manufacturers have their own version of IPS. Samsung calls theirs um, PLS, which they claim has some advantages, but for our purposes, I'm gonna bung them all into the same IPS category. So IPS screens are best for design, photo and video professionals who need image accuracy and quality. However, IPS panels tend to be a little more expensive and generally, but not always, they have higher input lag. But they can also suffer from something called IPS glow, where the backlight of the actual screen bleeds into the edges. Now moving on to VA panels, and these are quite a good compromise between TN and IPS, but there are fewer models available. Now these tend to have better colors, contrast, and view angles than TN, but not quite as good as IPS although they do offer higher potential refresh rates, improved contrast, and potentially much higher brightness than IPS, which is why most HDR monitors do use VA panels. We'll get into that in a second. However, they can suffer from color distortion and contrast loss when viewed from off angle, and also the response time can be a bit higher. So with fast motion competitive games, you can see some slight blurring or ghosting. The final type is OLED, which is a great technology with the best contrast ratios, great response times, and higher color accuracy. But that said, they can suffer from temporary or even permanent image retention if the picture is left on like this for an extended period of time. And also they're extremely expensive and also very rare right now. So I wouldn't recommend one for the time being. Okay, that is quite a lot to take in. So which one should you buy? Well. TN is a good option if you're on a strict budget, and it's fine. But if you want an all-purpose monitor for work, for watching videos, or even a little gaming, I would definitely recommend spending a bit more on an IPS or a VA panel, as you're getting a much better image. But if you are a gamer, then a good IPS, preferably with a high refresh rate, would be best. And it'll have nearly as low input lag and response times as a TN, and also avoids the blurring you can get with VA. If you are a serious competitive gamer though, then you should choose a model with a very high refresh rate, and also probably a TN to get the lowest possible response times. But if you're a professional that deals in graphical work, then you should definitely go for a good quality IPS for the best image quality and highest color accuracy. So we've already kind of touched on refresh rates, but what does it actually mean? Well, the refresh rate of a monitor is how many times the screen image is updated every second. The higher the number, the smoother the on-screen motion looks. Refresh rates are measured in Hertz, and most monitors, including this one here, will refresh 60 times per second, so it's 60 Hertz. And that's fine, but if you're a gamer, you'll prefer 100, 120, 144, or even 240 Hertz refresh rate monitors for a much smoother and faster gaming experience. But of course, a higher refresh rate usually also means higher cost. And also remember that you'll only see the benefit of it if your PC has enough grunt to render all those frames every second. If you've only got a fairly average PC and you're getting like 80 or 90 frames per second, then you're not gonna fully take advantage of that high refresh, unless of course you're willing to drop your graphic settings. So I think refresh rates are fairly straightforward, but then we move on to adaptive sync, and this gets a little tricky. So for the smoothest possible gaming experience, try to get a monitor that supports variable refresh rates or adaptive sync, because this eliminates what's known as screen tearing. 
So this has the effect of where part of the screen displays one frame and another part that's slightly offset. And it's especially obvious at lower frame rates below 60 FPS, and it can be pretty distracting. So an adaptive sync screen can synchronize its refresh rate to the exact number of frames coming from your graphics card, which means cleaner, smoother motion. And it also avoids the compromises of older workarounds like V-Sync, which would usually increase input lag and sometimes result in stuttering. So there are three main types, NVIDIA's G-Sync, AMD's FreeSync 1 and FreeSync 2, which are similar to the third type, Visa's Open Adaptive Sync standard. Now, G-Sync monitors can cost several hundred pounds more, and they have a custom controller chip that's built in and requires an NVIDIA graphics card for that variable refresh rate. Whereas, FreeSync 1 or 2 or Adaptive Sync monitors don't have a chip, so you can use any compatible AMD or NVIDIA graphics card. So NVIDIA's G-Sync comes in a few different flavors. We have regular G-Sync, which guarantees a certain level of performance. Then we have G-Sync Ultimate, which adds HDR and extra brightness, and also allows for variable refresh at very high refresh rates. And finally, we have G-Sync Compatible, which are AMD FreeSync 2 monitors, which meet certain performance criteria. Most other FreeSync 1 and 2 monitors that aren't listed as compatible will likely work with G-Sync, but just how well they work will have to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Although FreeSync 2 monitors will probably work better and adds features like HDR, lower latency, and it also removes the lower frame limit for which it works. So my advice would be to choose a FreeSync 2 monitor as it's cheaper, it works well with AMD graphics cards and will likely be nearly as good as a regular G-Sync panel, but not cost anything extra. Still with me? That was quite a lot to take in, but we've got a few more topics that I do want to cover. So next up we have response times and input lag. Now sometimes these are confused as the same thing, but they are both important in their own way. Now response time is how quickly a pixel can change what it's displaying, usually from one shade of gray to another or gray to gray response, and it's measured in milliseconds. Now a higher response time can result in more motion blur, which can be seen as ghosting, those trails that follow fast moving objects in games and videos and can give you a bit of a smeary image. So TN panels offer the fastest response time, sometimes as low as one millisecond and are ideal for competitive gaming, fast paced gaming. IPS panels are a bit slower, usually around five milliseconds, but that's fine for most people and you probably wouldn't really notice the difference. And then we have VA. Now some premium VA panels can have very fast response times, but generally these are the slowest and the most likely to suffer from blurring. Now input lag, on the other hand, is not usually advertised by the manufacturer, but it is also worth checking, especially if you're a gamer. And it refers to the time between when the graphics card outputs an image signal and then when it's actually displayed on the screen. So for example, the time between clicking the mouse button and the gun firing in your game. So again, like response times, the less time this takes, the better. Response time and input lag are often measured as a combined value. And so anything under around 15 milliseconds combined is pretty reasonable, although under 11 is ideal. Next up, we have high dynamic range or HDR enabled monitors, and these can look awesome. They have a greater contrast range between the brightest and the darkest parts of an image and a wider color range. So games and programs that are optimized for HDR can look really impressive. But unfortunately, not all HDR is made equal. And an important measurement is the maximum brightness level of the monitor. We measure them in nits and a higher score is better. So we have the display HDR standard, which lists monitors under three tiers. We have HDR 400, which gives you 400 nits of brightness. And this is kind of considered to be the baseline. Then you have HDR 600 and premium HDR 1000 for 1000 nits. But you can also find panels that are just listed as HDR 10, which refers to the 10 bit color depth, but they can have varying degrees of brightness. It's difficult. Many people maintain that you don't get true HDR unless you have 1000 nits and 10 bit color depth and anything less is fake. Well, be prepared to pay a lot of money if you want both of those in a PC monitor. Now, generally VA panels offer the best HDR and some of the higher end models will actually use quantum dot filters like Samsung's TVs to increase the brightness further. OLED monitors are also great for HDR, but given their cost and the scarcity, I can't really recommend them right now. So getting a good HDR panel will make most sense if you're planning on watching loads of HDR content on, I don't know, Amazon Prime or Netflix, 
or maybe you're going to plug in your Xbox or PlayStation, your HDR enabled console, or even if you're going to play some PC games. But the problem with PC games is HDR support is patchy at best, even if it is getting better. Some games have implemented what is known as fake HDR, where the dynamic range isn't really improved at all, but a filter is added to basically give that impression to accentuate the brightest areas on the screen and of course also increase color saturation. But the type and the quality of HDR will depend on how the game has been developed. So throughout this video, I've been saying how TN, IPS and VA all offer slightly different color accuracies. And this can be measured against a range of color gamuts, such as sRGB, Adobe RGB, and also DCI-P3. And the closer the monitor is to matching 100% of that color gamut, the more color accurate it is. And what can influence that is the type of panel used and also the color depth. Is it 6-bit, 8-bit or 10-bit? Pretty much everyone should avoid 6-bit. 8-bit is fine for almost everyone. But if you are a professional color calibrator or photo editor, then you may want to look for a 10-bit panel, although you will pay more for that. But also be careful because a lot of technical specs will suggest a monitor is 10-bit, but actually it's only 8-bit and uses a technology called FRC to artificially simulate that extra color. So it's not true native 10-bit, although it will be a bit of an improvement. And that bit color depth indicates how many shades of color a monitor can display. But then how accurate that is, as I say, we test against things like sRGB and Adobe RGB. And generally, for the average user, I would look for anything that's over 90% sRGB and over 70% Adobe RGB. Although, of course, the higher the percentage, the more accurate it will be. The vast majority of new monitors will use an HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort 1.2 or 1.4, or USB Type-C as their main connector. Now, many will have both HDMI and DisplayPort connections, with more expensive and newer models also offering Type-C. In some cases, you'll find mini HDMI and mini Display Ports, which each, obviously, as it says on the tin, use a smaller connector, but otherwise they are the same. You will need to check your graphics card or your laptop ports to see which connection type to use. If, like me, you're outputting from your graphics card, then generally I would recommend using DisplayPort. 1.2 supports high refresh rates and 4K at 60 Hz, and actually DisplayPort 1.4 supports up to 8K. And also, we do have to consider HDMI 2.1, which is coming soon, and is going to offer even more bandwidth and higher resolutions and higher frame rates, but Right now, that is very, very rare, so I'll probably cover that in my next video. But then we also do have USB-C ports, which you'll find on newer graphics cards and laptops. Some Type-C ports are also Thunderbolt 3 enabled, which is an even higher bandwidth technology and means you can output to multiple high-resolution displays. Okay, that was a lot to take in, and fair play if you've managed to stick with me this long. But the big question is, what should you buy? If you want a decent home and office monitor that doesn't break the bank, go for a 22 or 24 inch 1080p IPS or VA panel. And if you can stretch your budget a little bit, go for a 27 inch 1440p. Now, if you're a creative professional working with photos, videos, design work, then a good quality 27 inch 1440p IPS, or if your budget allows maybe even a 32 inch 4K IPS, will be your best bet. And aim for ones with the highest color accuracy. Most good reviewers will include that in their review. But if you need a highly productivity focused monitor with loads of screen space, then consider a 29 or 34 inch ultra wide, or maybe even a larger 43 or 49 inch super ultra wide. But if gaming is a priority for you, then do try to get a model with a higher refresh rate, anything above 60 Hertz. And also if you can, try to get one with an adaptive sync technology, such as FreeSync 2 or G-Sync if it's not too much more money. And that's it, congratulations. You now know more about monitors than any normal person should. And as you can probably tell, I'm starting to lose my voice as this was quite a long video. And don't forget to check my recommended monitors in the description below. So I really hope you found this video useful. If you did, hit that like and subscribe button down there somewhere. And I'll see you guys next time right here on The Tech Chat.